Okay, welcome to our latest in this live stream series. I'm Zach Weissmuller with my colleague here, Nick Gillespie. And uh, today uh, I am thrilled to have just one of my favorite people joining us. Uh, he's a clear thinker, an extremely entertaining podcaster, a dad, a successful entrepreneur, the man, the legend, Camille Foster. Thanks wow. for joining us, Camille. Thank you for. Thank I don't. You for I don't you. think he's that great, but <laughs> yeah, it's good forgot, to see him. <laughs> you forgot yeah. to say sex symbol, Zach. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. Is well, well, you know, uh, Camille, this is an honest, truthful outlet. <laughs> uh, you know, this isn't one of your cable news, news programs. Fake yeah. news. <laughs> so I, I want to get a little uh, meta this afternoon and talk uh, what it about what what's like uh, what it is that you like to talk about and to set that up. I'm just going to play an intro to your podcast, The Fifth Column, which I have no doubt many of today's viewers are quite familiar with. We, we know of new methods of attack. The Trojan Horse, The Fifth Column. Greetings, and welcome back to another exciting installment of the Fifth Column Podcast. This is your weekly rhetorical assault on the news cycle of the people that made it, and occasionally ourselves. I'm Camille Foster. I do various things at Freethink, and today we had, we had a delayed start because apparently there's this this really interesting, compelling, engrossing profile of... So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your weekly rhetorical assault on mm -hmm. the news cycle and the people who make it. You like to yes. talk about media. <laughs> And in fact, I think of Fifth Column largely as a media criticism podcast. That'd be correct. Why is that such a foundational aspect of what you do? Well, I think media literacy is important uh, in a free society. We, we need access to information. The people who bring us information um, uh, play a, a, an important role, uh, but they need to be held accountable and citizens need to be equipped with the tools to be able to discern what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Uh, I think there's an analogy that I've used of someone who's like going down into a mine, which, you know, this is very filthy, difficult work. They bring up something, they kind of dust it off a little bit, and it sort of seems to sheen, has a sheen and it's yellow, but is it gold or is it fool's gold? And making a determination between those two things is not always easy, but it is definitely worth doing. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think that that's what we try to do at the fifth column with a great deal of levity. Uh, we operate at a couple different speeds. Sometimes it's very sober and serious. Uh, at other times, it is completely ridiculous and careens out of control. Uh, but either way, it's worth your time and your money. So subscribe. Oh, yeah. Always be uh, selling, right? What is the worst, what's the worst job? that you had because uh, you are talking as if you've been in a mine. Uh, have you been in a mine? <laughs> I've never been actually, I'm sure I've been in a mine. I've never worked in yeah. a mine. The worst job I've had was probably a clerical gig. I took at like 14 oh or 15. In paper a car yeah. I know. I understand. Yeah. The physical labor that I've had to do has always been kind of rewarding, you know, like yeah. swinging an ax to chop wood or something like that. It's, it's, okay fun it's great you get to be outside what like how did you get how did you get uh you know kind of hip to the idea that like the news is the news is raw material or it's pre-packaged in a way that you know you as the consumer the reader whatever has to really do the work to figure out what this means and where you know where does it come from what's it mean and where's it going yeah i think it's probably uh carl sagan's bullshit detector kit um, it, it's actually not bullshit. I think he uses the word baloney, but bullshit is an appropriate um, word as well. Um, and I believe I was introduced to that in one of his books. It might have been oh. uh, the the one about, uh, I'm forgetting the title at the moment, but that was one of the first things that I remember mm. um, kind of touching this like skeptical bone that I have in my body. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I was raised in a in a very, a devout household and was surrounded by literature um, mm -hmm. and specifically <laughs> had to read a lot of uh, the biblical account and can distinctly remember the first time I encountered like the doubting Thomas and this notion that there is kind of, it's blessed to be someone who believes without seeing. And that never sat well with me yeah. <laughs> because it just doesn't seem like uh, like a good quality to have. So I'm I'm a bit of a skeptic, but I think in a very, 
productive sense. I think it's in, it's unnecessary to have a kind of a skeptical disposition so long as it's productive. I think that's very different from cynicism. Yeah, uh, you're also very libertarian. How did you how did you come to you know? So you're skeptical to begin with. That can lead in a lot of directions, but then you're also libertarian. How did that come about? Uh, I can say with some certainty that the very first libertarian thing that I read uh, was probably Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. I was in college and someone said to me during a conversation, Camille, you're far too bright to be a Democrat. And I don't know how he got me to this book, but he did. And in the introduction to the book, there's this treatment of Kennedy's speech where he talks about, he says, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And Milton Friedman goes on to explain that neither side of this is consistent with the ideals of a free man in a free society mm -hmm. and goes on to articulate this vision of free people working towards their several goals within mm -hmm. a free society. And our goal being to, to maintain that free, that, that, that kind of system of freedom and for whatever reason, you know, I'm, I'm a sophomore, junior in, in college, mm -hmm. and I'd never been exposed to that clear a distillation of what freedom could be, ought to be. And it was immediately appealing and resonated with me. And I went on from there to read a number of other things, including Bastiat's The Law um, and a couple of other kind of foundational books. And then I discovered Reason and Cato, and I started reading some guy named Nick Gillespie and- yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then all downhill. Further from radicalized there. from there. Well, then I found Rothbard, and that's what really, really got yeah. me going. Uh, well, we'll get I to know. Rothbard. <laughs> towards the end. Where Where did you go to college, and what was what did you major in? University of Maryland College Park. Um, I started as a biochemistry major. Um, my end of my first semester, I went home and started watching C-SPAN like religiously, and I discovered Washington Journal, and I got really hooked. Mm -hmm. And without telling my mom. I changed my major to government and economics like the very next year. And I didn't actually end up completing the term in a normal way. I, after my second year of college, I started a telecom consulting firm and slowly built up this lifestyle business and ran that for about 10 years. Um, but I eventually completed my two degrees in government and economics. And that was important. But I think having that kind of protracted uh, undergraduate experience also gave me an opportunity to just do a lot of independent reading uh, and to find and pursue my interests and to select where there were kind of elective courses, stuff that was really consistent with what was most interesting to me. And I think all of that probably contributed to my, my odd development. Hmm. It's interesting hearing you uh, kind of put skepticism at the center of what you're doing. Like what, how does that interact with, or I guess inform your politics? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, I think, I think like skepticism and fallibility are, are critical foundational pieces of what you need, like the kind of culture of freedom. Um, certainly like the notion of free speech is rooted in this sensibility that whatever the dominant ideas, there is some new perspective which might be heretical today, but is ultimately right. And it is vitally important that we actually have a system and a culture uh, that is okay with people challenging the, the dominant perspectives that are on offer and overturning them and that this is a natural process. And I mean, I think even today, in our very modern society, my sense is that most learned people believe we've kind of reached the definitive end of history and the end of philosophy, that there are no new um, inspiring ideas that'll be brought to bear and that there couldn't be anything that they believe that isn't absolutely right and true. Um, it's, it's this like thoroughgoing fundamentalism and it exists on the left and the right. Um, but I think people with this kind of classical liberal bent, libertarians have a much better appreciation of just how difficult it's been for us to get where we are and how likely it is that we're wrong about plenty of things. Right. And the, the ever present possibility that we could retrace our steps and go backwards and fall into something worse. And yeah. I think that's, I think it all, it all kind of flows together in that way. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm very worried about the, the retracing the steps. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, with, with As regards to kind of your skepticism of narratives that come to dominate um, politics or media, I think a really good example of that was uh, you've been a guest a couple times on uh, your friends with Barry Weiss, who hosts mm -hmm. a podcast called Honestly, which I, I very much enjoy. Uh, but you were on there a couple times um, talking about the so-called Central Park Karen case. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I want to play an excerpt from your first appearance where you kind of explained your thoughts about all that. Um, and I want to go from there and just talk about how representative it is of the way you think about much of how the media frames stories, why they do it, why it might be a problem. Uh, so let, let's play that clip first. All this is happening against the backdrop of America's racial reckoning, which is just in its earliest weeks. George Floyd, I can't George Floyd, I can't and during that period, you had nightly protests all over the country, and New York City was certainly no exception. More tense clashes around the country, including this standoff at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, where a police car burned as officers pepper spray. There were demonstrations in front of the mayor's house, in front of City Hall, in the streets of Soho. And from what I've learned about the case, it's hard for me to ignore the likelihood that the decision to proceed with this prosecution against the odds was largely a, a public relations stunt. So, I mean, what, why was this case so interesting to you? Um, and just what are, I guess, some of the lessons you took away from digging a little deeper into it? Well, I think the best way to give you context for that is to <clears throat> explain how I discovered that there was something worth looking into here. Uh, fully a year after this, this woman, Amy Cooper, uh, had her encounter with a man named Christian Cooper, no relation, in Central Park, I was reading a story uh, on NBC um, I guess, I guess it's just NBC.com. Maybe it's NBCnews.com, probably that. And somewhere buried in the story about a lawsuit that she'd filed against her former employer for wrongful termination was a couple of lines about this guy named Jerome Lockett, who had had a previous encounter with Christian Cooper. And the NBC story, all it says is that Jerome Lockett, um, that a letter from Jerome Lockett to NBC News was included in the legal filing. And NBC, the article goes on to say that NBC spoke to Jerome Lockett at the time that the, the attack happened, or the, not attack, but the encounter happened. And it doesn't provide any additional detail. And I went looking for any story that they would have written related to this Jerome Lockett situation. And the, the situation with Jerome Lockett was that Christian Cooper, the gentle bird watcher who, who, who um, recorded Amy Cooper and made her famous, he'd had two physical altercations in Central Park in the previous four months, at least two that we know of. And he admitted to this in a, in a private context. And I found the audio for that. Um, and I think if people know that, they probably approach the story about Amy Cooper in that 30 second video with a slightly different perspective. And the fact that NBC News had talked to Jerome Lockett, a 30-year-old black man who had an encounter with Christian Cooper that ended with him having to push him away from his dog because he felt unsafe, um, that they decided not to run this story. And they never bothered to explain why they didn't run this story. I even reached out for comment to the editors and the reporters that were responsible for interviewing him at the time. Um, is kind of shocking. And what became more shocking to me was that as I continued to look around and I talked to more journalists, and I think this is ultimately, there's the human tragedy of sort of Amy Cooper being pilloried for something that isn't obviously what people imagine. Um, but the, the heart of the story is that a number of journalists at media outlets, some conservative and some liberal, knew about um, the, the de additional details that there were other people and that they were too incurious or too afraid to actually complicate this story in a way that made it look like anything other than a crazy Karen white woman calling the police on a black man in order to get him murdered. It didn't matter to them that Christian Cooper had in the weeks prior been advocating for more law enforcement in Central Park because he wanted to have cops there to enforce leash laws. 
he was not afraid of being murdered by the cops. At least that doesn't suggest those aren't the actions of someone who believes they'll be murdered by the cops. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, d does this kind of stuff happen? Sure. I think yeah. there are plenty of examples of it. And we've seen lots of examples of rather crummy moral clarity. <laughs> moral clarity is a phrase that we know now. Um, motivated reasoning that that is ostensibly supposed to be journalism, but is anything but. To Christian Cooper's, you know, credit, he really did not seem to want to pursue this once it became a media mouse. Well, I mean, now he's got like a, a Netflix show or whatever. But I was going to say, it's, is it it's, it's debatable? Christian Cooper decided that he didn't want to participate in the prosecution and at some point decided to no longer do media after ha right. having done a lot of media. I wouldn't want to prosecute either if I knew that when I got up on the stand and was cross-examined, a great deal of things would be made public that thus far right. the media had systematically ignored. Without focusing on him though, like the, the speed with which her employer canned her and the whole hours. story yeah. became kind of set in stone that this is a woman who is, you know, the moral equivalent of the woman who uh, said that Emmett Till had whistled at her. Mm -hmm came you know that was the narrative with capital letters um how do we guard against that in a world where there is a rapid response you know we have all forms of media everybody has a voice but you know some voices care for more what you know how do, how do we slow the the race to the narrative down in a way so we have better responses yeah, the, some voices count for more. And also we have this bizarre media ecosystem where you've got algorithms that push stories and uh, journalist, journalistic outlets that publish stories instantaneously and a, a culture wherein we are primed to grab this 30 second clip devoid of context and retweet it to all of our followers. And I think the, the best thing that we could do, the greatest safeguard would be for us to one, be more skeptical, <laughs> dutifully, rigorously skeptical. Yeah. Um, but two, to just develop, and maybe that skeptical muscle is part of this, the appropriate set of cultural antibodies that allow us to exist in the world as we find it today. Like the current media ecosystem, the, the current level of connectedness is something that we are simply not designed to deal with. Um, it, it manages to play on kind of all of our like weird cognitive biases in ways that can be incredibly harmful. And I think it's, it's imperative to imagine that this story that you're reading about the person who was purportedly the worst kind of person could be you. It could be yeah. that they said something inelegant. And if, if you actually care about the purported injustice that took place, then you should care enough to want to know the difference between an actual crime and an imagined crime between uh, a pol uh, an impoliteness or um, or a mistake and someone who is a vehement racist or an anti-Semite. Like the difference matters. It's not trivial. Yeah, Zach, that thing, sounds like a good tee up, right? For some of the clips or go ahead. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing that I took from that was, um, you know, especially the, the clip there makes it clear the context of this was coming on the heels of the kind of you know uprisings that were happening after the the George Floyd killing, and there was all this energy around this issue, and so that's perhaps you know one lesson for the skeptic to take is when there's mm -hmm. a lot of discussion or energy around a particular issue, and then stories begin to pop up that just like very conveniently like further that, mm -hmm. maybe that takes that warrants you know an, an extra look. Um, and like like one of the political narratives that I think we could all examine right now uh, as we approach the midterms is and it seems like kind of the winds of political change uh, might be coming. Um, and there's a lot of stories, a lot of narratives about what exactly that means. One of the framings uh, that you're hearing, especially from Democrats, is that this is a bunch of fascistic election deniers on the brink of seizing power. Um, the reality might be a little more complicated than that, uh, but let's play this clip from uh, Hillary Clinton uh, to get a sense of the message that Democrats are putting forward right now. This is for um, like a kind of pack that she um, is, is behind. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's a fundraising appeal that this is the message 
that she feels is appropriate to be putting out right now. Extremists already have a plan to literally steal the next presidential election. <laughs> and they're not making a secret of it. So um, what's your reaction to the discussion around, you know, election security, fraud, and the upcoming midterms? I mean, anyone who's been paying attention ought to know that since the, around the 2000 election where good, Gore v. Bush, um, which ended up in, in the courts in order to get decided, there's been growing skepticism in both political parties about the, the uh, trustworthiness of our electoral process. And we've seen kind of a, a one-upsmanship like in every single national election cycle in the midterms as well this year with people increasingly suggesting that the outcome is dubious, that the other side is cheating, that they're going to cheat, they'll definitely cheat. And you can tell who is going to, generally, you can tell who's going to be the most full-throated in decrying the outcome of the election based on who wins and who loses. Um, except Donald Trump is the exception to the rule here because he was still insisting that the election had been yeah. kind of mucked with um, yeah, and, he never accepted the <laughs> even when he won in the results. Yeah, because he he was like, I would have won like with fifty four percent of the vote if they had yeah. counted all the ballots. Yeah, so he's he definitely has kind of perfected this entire thing yeah. uh, in the worst sorts of ways. But it, this is hardly alien to Democrats, and Hillary Clinton seems to be indulging in the same thing. And uh, I mean, look, it's it's not as though there aren't extremists who are articulating their perspective on what ought to happen, on how elections ought to be taken, on, on reinstalling the president, the former president of the United States. He himself continues to insist that this ought to happen, but exaggerating the degree to which this is a thing. Referring to some marginal figure in the conservative movement, in the fringes of the conservative movement, and suggesting that there is this bold plan to steal the next election yeah. is precisely what Democrats would call this if Donald Trump was doing it or, or any of his acolytes. It is dangerous rhetoric that that in increases um, concern and skepticism about the quality of our institutions at a time when what we should really be doing is talking about transparency, like trying to build trust. And we're not doing that. And that is that's deeply concerning. Yeah, Hillary's uh, that group is called the uh, indivisible or indivisible, and she refers to them as the indivisibles. <laughs> but um, you know, it's, their their catchphrase is "crush the coup." Yes, it's like a violent image That's crushing crazy. a coup, which is itself a violent takeover of the government. Yes. You have talked, uh, you know, about how. St yeah, I mean, there's no question. Trump is Trump is like the you know, the Pavarotti of this, right? He can, mm -hmm. he can play, he can sing any song you want to hear about election fraud and his <laughs> followers, people like Carrie Lake, who's probably going to become governor of Arizona is an insane sycophant of Trump, you know, but then there's people like Stacey Abrams, the, who lost the gubernatorial race in, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in Georgia a few years ago and has never conceded um, what, what are your thoughts about the way she represents a kind of democratic mode of challenging the outcomes of clearly legitimate elections? Yeah, no, I mean, Stacey Abrams is a, is a incredibly interesting character in American politics. This is a woman who has been sainted despite having never really won anything in electoral politics. Um, she's most famous for losing an election insisting that she lost by a fraud and now several years later we know launching an ex incredible perhaps the most expensive in the history of georgia legal challenge um to hey, this Camille, let me pull up uh i pulled some clips from this recent politico article on that i just want to just to yeah. give everyone a sense of how expensive and and failed this operation was um more than $25 million over two years on legal fees, mostly on a single case with the largest amount going to the self-described boutique law firm of the candidate's campaign chairwoman. Um, the, judge <laughs> recently, to see here. the judge who ruled against her said the challenge practices violate neither the Constitution yeah. nor the Voting Rights Act. Um, That's a and, slam dunk. <laughs> You know, what, what she had claimed after she uh, lost to Kemp uh, 50 to 48 
was that thousands of voters, a disproportionate number of whom were people of color, were effectively disenfranchised by mm -hmm. overly restrictive voting rules. So, yeah, I mean, what what message does that send about, you know, trustworthiness of, of our institutions um, and all that money spent to come up with very little uh, in at the end of the day? Look, it's it's impossible for me to read her mind. I can't know whether or not there was, you know, d deliberate fraud here. I can't know whether or not she was acting in bad faith or any of that other stuff. I don't need to 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 to, to um, speculate about her motives. Um, but what we can say is that it is incredibly unseemly to be enriching to the tune of tens of millions of dollars your very good friend and campaign manager while you are drumming up all of these rather wild. Um, conspiracies about what happened in the election. I mean, she, they even included in the original, in the original legal filing, which was incredibly complicated and long, um, this voluminous legal filing claims about election machines that weren't acting properly, that they had been hacked in some way, shape or form um, because people were trying to push Abrams, but that it would switch to Kemp. I mean, this is, this is hypocrisy that would be risible if it wasn't so consequential. There's, uh, you know, the the connection that I see here between what we were talking about in media coverage and, um, you know, all the kind of innuendo swirling around elections is just this decreasing trust, being able to trust, you know, what you see, being able to trust uh, out uh, supposed outcomes. And and part of this, you, you know, you were mentioning earlier this confusion that is being created by, I don't know, digital media in general, our inability to cope with information overload and, and so forth. And, and now layer on top of that, you know, the ability to manipulate uh, for, you know, purposely manipulate media, both in just by clipping things out of context and just like outright altering mm -hmm. clips. And we, we did pull a couple of examples of uh, that from uh, various political operatives that have engaged in that. This first one here is uh, Jill Biden. This was a recent one. Um, Dr. Dr. <laughs> Jill Biden. <laughs> Dr. Jill Biden, my apologies. And uh, this is a uh, just, you know, everyone, this is a doctored clip. Uh, so be forewarned. Realize that even the smallest flame can illuminate our path home that the sweetest delicacies are made with love, that the most rewarding gifts are those we give to Shut the fuck up! Hey! Hey! Right. And then there's also this one that I saw recently. This written. is um, from a kind of political operative uh, named Bubba Prague on Twitter. And this one actually earned him the uh, stay informed tag from Twitter and a little, uh, you know, uh, correction on the sidebar. Um, this is incredibly obviously fake to me. Um, I don't know why people fell for it, but it's got like 40,000 likes on Twitter and you can kind of see how he frames it. He's like writing that line between, um, you know, trying to say that it's satire, but actually I want to also dupe as many people as I can with this. So uh, let's play this real quick. This raid happened and it was a raid. Yeah, gonna, it's not a raid. I mean, I, with all due respect. It of course was a raid. It was not a raid. They were serving <laughs> valid process in accordance with the laws and constitution of the United States and the state of Florida. They did it with integrity. They did it with honor. <laughs> to say it's a raid uh, is, is disinformation, and you Why guys need to drop. Excuse me. So yeah, you, I mean disinformation. Sort of like problem to believe that I think, but um, but that's yeah. I mean it's, it's yeah. fascinating, isn't it? Because we now have. I mean, this was you know as somebody who was writing in the '90s about the rise of the internet and generally lowered uh, a technology, lowered price and cost for technology. Suddenly, you had everybody became able to basically do really good fakes. And that mm -hmm. obviously is only getting better and better. Um, I don't know. I I tend to find a lot of this stuff incredibly liberating uh, because this is a millennial, millennia old impulse by people to recontextualize and reconfigure official discourse into whatever they wanted. I mean, in the Middle Ages, you could be in various uh, principalities. This was true in England. 
if you were caught writing down what the king said in a public setting and you weren't officially his amanuensis, you could be killed because <laughs> they wanted to control the, you know, the discourse. Right. So yeah, on a certain level, like I'm all for this kind of stuff and the more ludicrous and the better it is, you know, that like the, the more believable it is, the better. Um, but it does lead to cynicism, right? Where you mm -hmm. like, you cannot believe anything that you see. You really have to check, you know, you got to check out whether your mother loves you and, you know, whether the footage of her telling you you're a piece of shit is real or not. Well, that's the old, the old journalism dictum. And, right. and I think, you know, I think you make it a, a really great point, Nick. I, I had a conversation with someone about um, education uh, the other day, and they were saying something about these AI um, softwares that can write entire yeah. essays for you. And as they get better, this creates a real conundrum for schools because, I mean, you assign an essay to a yeah. kid and they just use the algorithm and writes them the thing and they get a great, perfect score. Right. And my feeling about this is, you know, it's easy to kind of fetishize the tech and to think about this as this intractable problem we'll never be able to solve. But the reality is that there's two things going on. One, that we've been here before and you could always hire someone to kind of write a paper for you. You probably need to the extent this becomes a widespread phenomena. Maybe you need to change the model. We evolve right. and we do things a little bit differently. And the second thing is that our countermeasures to these things are improving markedly every single day. And there are some really impressive efforts underway to do things like put um, uh, digital content on chain so that there is a clear chain of custody and you have a sensibility about authenticity and entire organizations that I suspect will exist at some point in the near future yeah. to help verify content and to verify the verifiers. And yes, that is the world we'll be in, but in a very real sense, it's, it's a world that we've always lived in. When there were right. only three media sources, the capacity of the state to lie to you um, in various ways existed. It was real and tangible. And I would say that it was almost certainly greater than today. Is it hard to know things? Sure. I suspect that's, it's complicated. There's a lot of things right. going on. Martin Gurry's book, uh, Revolt of the Public is really informative on that, but um, it's always been hard to know things. And for a lot of us, I think we probably weren't unaware of the degree to which we were being fed uh, oversimplified narratives or outright falsehoods that benefited someone. Um, which shouldn't make you cynical. It should make you skeptical. And being right. skeptical and concerned about what's true because the truth matters means that you should should get serious. Do more reading. Yeah. Read more than the headline. Don't share shit that might turn out to be fake because that is embarrassing. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I uh, just on that point of the essays, uh, my ex-wife and her husband, who are both full professors uh, at Chapman University. I was uh, went to dinner with them the other night, and they were talking about this because college professors now use a variety of programs where they check essays to see mm -hmm. if they've been plagiarized. There's yes. a database that they check again. <laughs> but they say the AI stuff because they have a lot of Chinese students from mainland China whose English is not good. Um, and the one way that one way that they know there's something up is when the grammar is perfect <laughs> because the AI like the words may not make much sense, right. but if they're grammatically perfect. So yeah, this is kind of like a man in the high castle world, you know, where they're selling fake replicas of the old West. <laughs> and if they're too good, you know it's a fake. But it's, the, the but, only option you, you had know, before that was Michael Moynihan reading your thing yeah, to find right. some weird cadence yeah. in there and say, "Oh, you're a plagiarist." It's, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. I think a lot going back to the nineties when, you know, when email became, was the killer app and then mm -hmm. there were viruses and like, you know, and you, you know, email, right. you didn't yeah. know about this or that. And it's like, we took care of that problem. You, you don't hear about computer viruses That's right. the way that you did circa 1995 or 96. Yeah. And, and I think that the, the, the perspective here on offer is that hysteria probably isn't warranted, but concern is fine. And mm -hmm. there's a real question about who will win the arms race and whether or not things may get out of control before we have appropriate solutions and remedies. Yeah. But there are yeah. appropriate solutions and remedies. And it is the case that we have kind of sort of been here before in some respects. Mm -hmm. And I think in general, with most things, if we could just bring down the temperature a bit, um, the, the, the closing argument in the midterms for both the left and the right is those other people are complete monsters who will destroy everything you hold dear if they win power this is the end of america yeah. either it's a cabal of groomers who want to mutilate your children's genitals or it's a cabal of fascists who hate everyone who isn't white 
and are going to put you into a camp and grind you into meat and feed you to their animals. It's, it's all preposterous and absurd, but it doesn't mean there aren't reasons for concern. But I think the thing I'm yeah. most concerned about at the moment is the fact that there is just this, this bottomless cynicism and hopelessness and an inability to trust one another. And we have to live together. That is, that's just the case. Like there's Can not I, it's not Can I say world. too, I mean, the, the pe let's blame the people who are most responsible for this, which of course are none, not one of us, none of the three of us, right. or libertarians, but uh, Zach, do you <laughs> want to play the Fetterman-Oz yeah. debate clip? Because this is who the two major parties, right, who mm. have all the money, all the power, all the institutional might, these are the apparitions that they're coughing up to you know, run in the, the greatest, you know, world's greatest deliberative body or something like that. <laughs> Tonight that you support fracking, that you've always supported fracking, but there is that 2018 interview that you said, quote, I don't support fracking at all. So how do you square the two? Oh. Uh, I, I, I do support fracking and I don't, I don't, I support fracking. And I stand and I do support fracking. Jeez. So, I mean, talk about cynicism. I mean, it's hard not to be cynical when you look at the <laughs> Pennsylvania race. You have Fetterman, who clearly has, you know, some serious impairments going against a celebrity doctor who's famous for <laughs> selling bullshit supplements to people. I mean, and then you have people and like... talk about Dakota. the rising inflation in the context yeah. of crudite. I mean, it's like, <laughs> what? Yeah. The, the, David Sirota is a, uh, oh, yes. you know, writer for the nation, a, yes. a progressive activist, worked for Bernie Sanders, saying, here's a truth few will say aloud, but I will. Being a senator is America's easiest job. You <laughs> say yay or nay. This notion that John Fetterman can't do that job because he's recovering from a health event is moronic and everyone in media. <laughs> I mean, you don't really get much more cynical about politics. Like, why don't we have like a hundred chickens, yeah. you know, just pecking at, <laughs> at cards to decide yeah, Go vote, all the way. Right? Go all yeah, the way. I mean, like, it's, it's opportunistic cynicism yeah. there, though. I don't, I don't think he actually believes that. My suspicion is if we look, he probably has some tweet about Herschel Walker being a dangerous idiot who shouldn't. Yeah. Be anywhere near the levers of power, which, which I is think true. is probably true. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but it's important when you're only willing to say it when it is to your advantage yeah. to say it. Um, and I think that's actually what's going on there. Um, but yeah, look, I, I'd, I'd say this. I've been saying a, a, a number of bad things about cynicism. It is appropriate to be cynical about most of your elected officials. They mm -hmm. are bad, self-interested cowards who aren't really willing to do anything that might get them into trouble if they actually think that it's the right thing to do. They won't vote against their party. They'll, they'll write a, a completely innocuous letter about Ukraine. And then moments later, when it seems politically in, in ex, unacceptable to their to their counterparts in Congress, they'll say, ah, that was a mistake. We're really sorry. But what is it? Why did you write the letter at all? Why did you sign it? Why did you think this was appropriate to notify the media again about if 24 hours later, actually eight hours later, the thing wasn't going to matter at all? They're just unprincipled people that can't be taken seriously. But how how this this is a big question, I think, particularly for libertarians, because, you know, the libertarian rhetoric is that all government uh, you know, or oftentimes the stereotypical uh, libertarian message is all government, all politicians are not just in a, in a you know, stupid uh, and incompetent, but they're evil. Uh, everything is bad. Um, is that a message? <laughs> is that a message that helps anything or does it just compound the problem? And how do libertarians talk about governance policy, mm -hmm. the individual's you know, who are going to make this up in a way that doesn't just give in to the rankest form of nihilism, where it, it really doesn't matter who's in office. Yeah. If you believe that they're always going to be terrible, what, what difference does it make? Well, I, I wouldn't say that it doesn't matter who's in office, um, but I, I do have kind of some heuristics and stratagems. Like I prefer divided government. So <laughs> if the Democrats control Congress, I probably want a Republican in the, house, in, in, yeah. um, the White House. And that's, you know, strategic thinking. Maybe that doesn't always lead to the best outcomes. But I, I think maybe the way to look at it is like government is endlessly corruptible. 
which is very different than saying like the institutions don't matter. I think that the institutions are actually important. I think our civic norms can be very important in, in, in certain respects um, when they're healthy, um, when they're kind of pro free speech and anti censorship, when there is a, a kind of visceral reaction to the notion that some, some corporation will be coordinating with government to shut people up who are saying things that might be unpopular because you just know that that isn't the way that we do things here. I think it's important for us to cultivate a respect for that. I think it's important even to be to have an admiration for the uniqueness of the American experiment. And I'm I'm a weird like anarcho capitalist bozo, but I know how unusual it is for there to be a country that is founded on the kinds of ideals that America imperfectly w is rooted in. Um, and those are ideas that are worth defending. Uh, and that are worth celebrating. And I think the the reality is that the personification of those ideas is not to be found in the halls of Congress. Um, and on any given day, it's probably not in the Supreme Court. It's in our associations with one another, the way that we pursue our own interests, the businesses that we build, the coalitions that we forge on our own. And if we can keep in mind that the goal of all of the governance stuff ought to be to enable that flourishing, to allow mm -hmm. us to to do and build things that are better than the things that existed before, then I think we'll be in a very good place. But if we imagine that either the revivalists who insist that what we need to do is retreat back to a time in the past when everything was perfect, or the redistributionists who insist the future is hopeless, the best we can do is take some stuff from those people and give it to you, then we will lose ultimately. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's where we find ourselves with. In fact, the revivalists have become reduced redistributionists as well, explicitly and openly which is another problem. Yeah. I'm curious if you think that there is um, like a clear, like libertarian friendly antidote to both the cynicism and the confusion that is happening in our media and politics right now. I mean, there is the libertarian party, which is in some of these Senate races and covering the spread in like mm -hmm. Georgia. And Nick and I did a documentary about the takeover that happened there. Yeah. Um, that, you know, the party what, is having what, an identity crisis at the moment. Yes, it's, you're right. It's having an identity yeah. crisis. It, um, it was before these kids took over as well. It's just a different sort of identity crisis. Well, it has yeah, an I'm identity curious. crisis now, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm curious, like, what do you, what you make of that identity crisis and what you hope comes out of it and what you hope libertarians will be offering. It, it doesn't even have to be, you know, big L libertarians, but what are the things that um, you know, you think libertarians could be putting on offer that's just not out there right now in either yeah. party or kind of the general discourse. I've, I've been generally optimistic about some of the trends that I'd seen happening. I can I can still remember when there was an, a story in The New York Times about the libertarian moment. Um, which I'm confident Nick was profiled in and, and mentioned mm. in um, because he was part of that. Uh, and I was excited. You know, you had you had Ron Paul and you had uh, Gary Johnson. And Rand you still Paul. have Justin, Justin Amash and even Rand Paul. That's right. He and, was on the cover of, the, yeah. you know, the story was, has the libertarian moment finally arrived? And it was. Yeah. And Rand, Rand is, is a complicated, complicated legacy yeah. in that regard. But in either case, they were pushing a certain set of ideas that were in fact resonating with a wider and wider swath of the country. And my hope was that after four years of Donald Trump and a great deal of dissatisfaction and a, a rather um, lackluster crop of candidates on the left to oppose him, that there might be a real opportunity for a moderate establishment even, you know, I know that's a dirty word, um, libertarian party to appeal to a lot of normies who might not be interested in or even prepared to have a conversation about all pri all the roads being private today or abolishing mm -hmm. all private schools tomorrow. I know mm -hmm. it's shocking for some of us to hear as, as, as near and dear as some of those concepts are to my heart that moderation and pragmatism is actually a good thing and it's helped to create the world that we live in today, which is undoubtedly, indisputably freer in so many important ways right. than the one that we lived in a couple hundred years ago and the fact that pragmatism helped get us there should say something about the importance of there being a political movement and a political institution that operates within the electoral system, within those confines, to try and bring more and more Americans into the fold. And I think at the moment, 
the party has adopted this kind of shock and awe strategy of kind of uh, of memeing their way to victory and outraging people who are both outside of the movement and in the movement of being incredibly polarizing. And this isn't to a person. I mean, I've had conversations with folks like Dave Smith, and I, I think Dave is a, is a good guy who is smart and bright and interesting and has a tremendous amount to offer. I wish that the people who are around him and that are operating the party would do so with a little bit more thoughtfulness. There is a tremendous opportunity here. And I think mocking people when they die, which is generally something that isn't regarded as okay, whatever the circumstances, mocking their children <laughs> after they've died, generally not acceptable. These are probably just not great strategies. Will it, will it go viral? Will you get a bunch of negative press? Sure. Is that what you want? Even to the extent that's how you could potentially win. I don't want to win that way. Um, but I also don't think you'll win. I think uh, ultimately you'll burn an ignominy and <laughs> We don't need that. We're already marginal <laughs> at the moment. I don't need to be notorious also. I want to give uh, Camille the, uh, I know Camille has to run soon. There were a couple of questions I just want to throw up here for you, Camille. Um, one was here, I'll just put it on the screen. I think there's one about the age of consent that we ought to go to immediately. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Talk about moderation. <laughs> must, uh, weigh in on that. Uh, Camille, yeah. across America, there are many students of Friedman and Ron Paul. Since they mm -hmm. won't sell out for votes, how do we amplify their voices? So I, I guess just asking, uh, I, that might get to the question of, you know, pragmatism versus purity. Um, like if there's someone like a Dave Smith who, you know, fashions himself as like, I'm, I'm carrying the torch of Ron Paul, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how far can that approach get you? Do you think? I mean, I think it can get you incredibly far. I mean, I think that the, the stuff that they've been doing, um, with respect to, to foreign policy, um, with respect to criminal justice, um, is is incredibly valuable. It's worthwhile to continue doing that work. Um, I think there are profound disagreements about the appropriate approach to addressing some of the weird social stuff that's happening. Um, a lot of the controversies in schools, whether or not it's appropriate to ban certain things out of existence about some of these gender debates. Um, but to the extent libertarians can be a, 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 a font of reason in these troubled times, that they can help to foster healthy conversations, I have to tell you that outside of elite circles where the, the fire is burning the most intensely, there is a legion, there are legions of Americans, I should say, who are interested in moderate voices, who are interested in sane alternatives, who want people who they can just say, God, you seem normal and nice. I could actually pull the lever for you. Like they're making a decision between Fetterman and Dr. Oz. Like, and, and you want to give them like meme warrior as the alternative? Right. I, I think we could probably do better than that. I, it, again, it's just a strategy. Maybe try to do both things a little yeah. bit. I don't know. How do you? Uh, uh, how how do how do all time? Not a question, that but that is that is uh, laudable. You sound like right, a good, go and decent human. Yeah. <laughs> um, how how do you think about deprioritizing politics? I mean, you know, for me, one of the reasons why I'm libertarian is because I dislike politics. I wanted to be in as small a space as possible because it is zero sum on some fundamental mm -hmm. level. There are certain things that are going to be decided where, you know, 50% plus one vote makes the other 50% minus one vote, eat it. And you just got to live that way. Yeah. So you want to keep that minimal. There was a, you know, there were various periods of the nineties was an example of this where, you know, there was a kind of consensus at the end of the cold war at the beginning of the uh, internet, ex you know, the internet and uh, economic expansion Politics wasn't that important. Let's go out and roam the world and have fun and do interesting stuff. That has been clawed back, you know, and it started probably, you know, with uh, the 2000 election, certainly 9-11, the economic crisis, you know, suddenly we live in a world now where, you know, God is, God is dead, but politics reigns supreme. Mm -hmm. How do we start to recalibrate, you know, so that we're talking more about culture, economic, you know, business lived experience and, you know, voluntary aspects of our lives rather than politics? I don't know precisely 
Um, my own approach to this is to remain optimistic and to believe that it's possible to kind of come back from the brink because we've dealt with things that are far more difficult than this in the past. Um, and to be determined to be involved in the system and in the process and to try always to get beyond the, the most controversial aspects of the debate. If uh, you know we're having an argument about abortion, it's probably best that we're not having it at the margins of whether it should be completely outlawed or mm -hmm. <laughs> whether or not mom should be able to have an abortion at you know nine minutes before she gives birth. Right. Like that's not going to be very productive if that's the only conversation we have. We, we're working at cross purposes, and I think in a similar way, um, there's questions about what public education ought to look like. If the argument is between the 1619 project and, you know, some America first version of history, like that's not going to be particularly good either. Um, so we've we've got to find not a middle ground, but some common ground. We've got to find ways to, to address the actual problem. And I think, you know, when we're having arguments about whether or not uh, uh, propaganda is being taught in the schools and ultimately know that the schools aren't really teaching kids much of anything. Um, that that is a more severe problem. And then it suggests that we're having these debates completely disconnected from the things that actually matter with respect to the stuff that, that we uh, ostensibly care about. If we care about kids and we care about them <laughs> becoming well-informed individuals, mm -hmm. thoughtful skeptics who can contribute in a meaningful way to the polity, um, then the way to do that is with a functional school system. And I'd say school choice ought to have always taken priority over these preposterous ideological battles. So you're objectively pro-groomer. Got it. <laughs> exactly. And it's reductivist uh, thinking like that that's going to get yeah. us, take, it's going to take us far. It's going to take us to the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Camille, thanks for joining uh, us. I know you've got to run soon. Let me leave you with these final two thoughts from our commenters. Maybe libertarians can put out there a charismatic candidate who never flies coach. That is and an interesting idea. Would say finer point on it, uh, Camille Foster. <laughs> and you obviously would do as well as Dr. Oz or Fetterman. Well, Fetterman, <laughs> Fetterman is a seasoned politician. So yeah, I mean, well, this is true. He's he's had some difficult. He's had a difficult year and probably should have pulled out of the race. It's it's yeah yeah yeah. No, no comment. I have to talk to my wife about 2024. She is the decider and chief. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well good we'll luck with that. Work. Thank you for uh, joining us. Thanks, Thanks guys. I appreciate all. it. Talk soon. You bet. All right. Well, I guess uh, now we should just talk shit about Camille, but are there other questions that we should uh, engage in here? Uh, let's see. One person asks here, um, can there ever be peace with Chris Rufo, um, hmm. you know, referencing our our live stream from last week, um, I think there can be peace with Chris Rufo. I think there is probably not ever going to be agreement, uh, at least on a wide range of topics with Chris Rufo. The reason we wanted to bring him on here to talk was I had produced this documentary about Florida's Stop Woke Act, and uh, Camille was kind of getting into that. Uh, near the end here about, well, are we going to spend our time fighting over whether a curriculum should be centered around um, Nicole Hannah-Jones' 1619 project or, you know, some sort of patriotically correct project yeah. devised by, you know, the DeSantis team or something? Or are we going to offer some sort of alternative vision where people have much more ability to select their own um education choice. And we want to apply that kind of thinking to just about every realm of life. And so that's just a fundamental difference that we have with somebody like Chris Rufo. So I appreciate him, yes, so. him coming on, but I'm not going to, you know, be able to make, I'm only going to be able to go so far uh, towards, towards that. Well, and I, I, you know, I think the the question is like one of, uh, you know, what does it mean to live in a pluralistic and a tolerant society where, you know, you I, you don't have we don't have to agree with him, obviously, but he also needs to respect our rights to teach, you know, our children the way we want. And we accord him the same right. And, the, you know, that it seems to me like a very clear and compelling case that 
There are going to be many different ways in which people want to talk about American history, where have they want to talk about uh, you know, any given matter, or even what schools should be teaching, broadly speaking. And um, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be complicated, really. Like, he's free to teach his kids the way they want and, you know, and attract more and more people. Um, and you and I would have difference of opinions, and then you throw in other people and, like, you know, let a, let a thousand flowers bloom on that. And pretty much on, on every possible issue. I, I agree. Um, I, another thing that um, Camille brought up that I thought might be worth discussing a little bit more is the idea that um, there, are, there are some emerging technological solutions to some of the confusion that we were talking about and some of the inability to tell what is real and, and what is not real. And that is kind of the promise of blockchain. I mean, Nick, you recently mm -hmm. interviewed Balaji Srinivasan, who talks uh, really eloquently about a kind of chain of custody over information. And I do think that we, we are, that need is increasingly urgent because what I'm concerned about mostly is the kind of memory holding that happens routinely mm -hmm. where people do stealth edits or pretend like something never happened. We have the Wayback Machine, which helps archive some of that, but that's not perfect. Some yeah. journalists have even got their Twitter feeds, you know, exempted from that. And so, um, and and I and when you think about, you know, uh, even like classic works being kind of revised to take out uh, problematic material, like, yeah. uh, I think it, it is really important to have a record of how things were because that is, you know, the ability to rewrite history is obviously a, a big concern yeah. for for anyone, and um, not least of all libertarians. Yeah, I totally agree. And this is where we've reached a point, you know, it, it's under, you know, on some level, the impulse is understandable, either that something is so hideous in the past that you want to, you know, kind of wipe it out so that we never have to contemplate it again, or you want to control the present, you know, to crib from uh, uh, Orwell, you want to control the, pr the present by controlling the past. But that is something, you know, I think uh, the term that Camille used was cultural antibodies. Like, you know, these these ideas, we need a, a, a resilient system where we're willing to look at what's happened in the past or even what's happening now, kind of honestly and openly and deal with our failures as well as our successes in the past and and recognizing that it's a process. But I agree. Um, you know, it's also true that a lot of uh, digital technology, and I'm thinking, or even in terms of things like radio, uh, which doesn't leave much of a trace, uh, but uh, television, you know, modern technology oftentimes erases its own past, um, you know, partly like a lot of TV shows in the 50s just disappeared because they were either, you know, performed live or the tapes that they were taped on got taped over, you know, things like that. Um, the historical record is is really important, and we I think we've been shortchanging it for a very long time. There's another comment here. Um, CRT is a combination of sexual Marxism and racial Marxism. It uses every racial and sexual variation as a weapon for collectivist power struggles. So yeah. th this is like um, the rhetoric that you hear a lot uh, anytime you get into this debate around conversations that people are having about race and gender right now. Um, I, I personally feel there's a lot to criticize in um, terms of how, like, you know, intersectional theory and the way that uh, these things are applied in like diversity seminars, I think is very, is often very clumsy and counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But um, this theory, there's this, you know, that this this overarching theory that people try to advance that it's some um like coordinated marxist plot and yeah. that is where i just think it gets a little bit dangerous but you, you have to take these things you know one at a time you can't lump it all together and when you kind of catastrophize things then that is how you justify authoritarian intervention because we suddenly have this emergency and we need to give these special powers to people to crack down on the bad thing that is uh, destroying society. So that's yeah, this is the, ironically, it's a, 
It's a Marxist, uh, uh, or Marxist influence theorist, uh, Giorgio Agamben, the Italian uh, social theorist who talks about states of exception right. and that modern governance, particularly in liberal democracies, is very prone to people getting whipped up and then saying, in order to preserve a liberal democracy where we have individual rights and civil liberties and things like that, we have to suspend them because of this intense threat. And it could be 9-11, it could be the economic crisis, it could be COVID. Um, and you end up inscribing, like in that comment, I have to say, I mean, I appreciate the person sending it, but it's nuts to think that there is a Marxist kind of conspiracy or then also to be focusing on racial and sexual categories um, as if, you know, Marxism is predicated upon the idea that there are groups, there are classes that are always at odds with one another and that, you know, everything is a twilight struggle where one will win and the other will lose. That is one way of looking at the world, which was rejected by the world. And it's bizarre to me that in many ways it's conservative critics of so-called critical race theory or Marxism are the ones who are keeping alive Marxist analysis. We need something better than that. Um, I do think it's, you know, we, we are in a time where, you know, for some of the reasons that we talked about in all of this, all of the kind of verities, all of the truths that we took for, you know, granted, that there are men and women, that there are blacks and whites, et cetera, like those are eroding, not because of some evil cabal, but because we're, I think we're more sophisticated and interested in individualism and speciation and things like that. But for many people, the idea that these basic categories are morphing or changing is terrifying. And they want to stop the movement of the world and say, no, this is the way it, it always has been and always must be, otherwise madness lies ahead. And that's just not a way, that, that is not a, uh, a way to create a productive and um, you know, positive future. It's, it's, it's you know, reactionary by definition and it doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere except into a worse version of an imagined past that we thought was so great. And I wonder if to wrap up the stream, Nick, if you yeah. might talk about um, this this terror that uh, people have of that shifting ground and kind of what we've been talking about, the confusion that all the fakery and all the yeah. um, kind of manipulative media that is out there and, and the cynicism in our politics, what would you say is um, like the liber part of the libertarian antidote to that or like what messages do you think libertarians um, could offer to help clear that fog of confusion mm -hmm. or give people just something else to aim for rather than what is being served up in say the Pennsylvania Senate race? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, first, and this isn't particularly libertarian, but echoing what uh, Camille was talking about, the, the centrality of kind of media literacy or, you know, and I actually, it's not even media literacy. I would say it's, you know, critical thinking um, is a basic component. And that's what our schools should be teaching is like, how, how do you create people who are more likely to be able to kind of analyze things and come to their own conclusions? That's like the core project of our, should be the core project of our educational system as opposed to making good citizens or making good workers or something like that. You know, we don't want compliant people. We want people who are independently minded. It is wearying. And I, you know, I say this as I was like a real utopian in the 90s. And I, and I still remain that. I mean, I'm optimistic about the future. And I think, you know, today is not just better than 200 years ago, but in most ways, it's better than 20 years ago. Um, and I think that, you know, continues to proceed apace, even if we never want to discuss that. But I think what libertarians, you know, have first off is a, a true optimism and a belief in the individual that individuals left to their own devices and, you know, armed with a little bit of resources and a little bit of analytical skill, uh, which most of us have and most of us develop over time are pretty good at figuring out how to live an interesting, productive life that is social and functional and kind of, you know, community oriented. It's a, you know, very few of us are like, you know, inwardly looking kind of narcissists who just want to run the world for our own benefit. We're, we're not like that. We're not designed to be like that and we don't end up that way. So I think that's part of the libertarian message is one of optimism and belief in individuals that, 
you know, it's tough, it's hard, but we're pretty good at figuring out how to live a meaningful life and coming up with interesting stuff. Um, I think the other thing, and this is something that I think libertarians, including myself, have spent, you know, years, you know, kind of knocking down institutions, both public and private, or public sector and private sector. Um, and you know, what we need to do is to kind of really come up with, uh, start talking more and more about examples of places where things are going well and looking at why. What are the underlying institutions, the networks of association, the temperaments or mindsets of people, and how do we broaden the scope of freedom of individuals being able to choose more in their life? This is you know right out of Mises and Hayek, the liberal project was about people having, you know, starting out with very few choices th that mattered in their life to having more and more choices. How do we model that? How do we kind of look at the places where it's working and build out from there rather than a kind of nihilistic dismissal of all politics as equally bad, all policy is equally bad. Um, you know, we, we need to be thinking more in those terms. I what about you, Zach? What is, you know, where do you go for that? I agree. Building on what works. And also, I like the idea of, um, you know, emphasizing the individual and creativity, unleashing creativity um, and imagination and innovation. Like these are all things that sprout from the bottom up. And this is something that sort of seems to be missing and really has been just squashed a little bit over the past couple of yeah. years with the pandemic and the uh, extreme overreach um, and this kind of just flattening of uh, individuals into these these broad groups yeah. that need to be managed. These large statistical like, categories, right? Like yeah, if you have COVID, you don't have COVID, et cetera. I mean, like an urgent need to break all that down. Um, and I, I'm not hearing it yet uh, from anyone in, in politics, um, mm -hmm. but you know, it starts with, uh, you know, I believe it's all it's all bottom up and it, it does start with, with the culture. And hopefully we can uh, if, push towards that. Yeah. If I might uh, add, you know, as you're talking, I'm also thinking like you you do this automatically and take it for granted. I know I try to focus myself on this, but like this is where an understanding of history is really important. I am, you know, my grandparents came to the United States, all four of them in the mid 19 teens. My parents grew up during the depression, they were poor. Uh, and I mean, everybody was poor, but they were poor. I'm like one generation removed from the ghetto. And what that has helped me, and I didn't realize this until I was older, like having that in the rear view, you know, in the near rear view mirror um, was helpful to understand how things continue to get better and how much, how much worse they could be, how much better they can be. My kids are living a life, at least materially, that is like, you know, was literally unimaginable by, by me as a kid. Um, and it's kind of great. And, you know, recognizing that progress, uh, both material progress and moral progress, these are not things that have to happen. It's a choice. Um, and, you know, what are the what are the ways that help make that happen? You know, that have worked in the past, that have worked in the present. And kind of, you know, keeping an eye on history is really important because I think to the extent that we stay like mired in these small, like inch by inch, you know, kind of battles over no man's land in every election, in every news cycle, all of this, if we're not thinking about transcendent values or where we want to be, you know, then it's just every day is a slugfest and it's just like, you know, you're stuck in trench, trench warfare from World War I or something. It's meaningless. Um, so I think history, you know, and again, that's not particularly libertarian. I mean, people will interpret history in different ways, but it gives a sense of perspective, which is oftentimes the the main thing that's lacking in debates over virtually everything. Yeah, I agree, especially that there that there has to be both of these, the contending with history and what could go wrong and kind of like the the villains, especially again, coming off the past couple of years, like we need to that should be a reminder of how things can backslide because that really was kind of an experiment an experiment in like what happens if we central suddenly centralize or politicize a lot of these processes that were left to the market and the outcome was not good and we don't want that um, so that should be criticized and and uh, you know to some degree demonized but 
when you demonize things, when all you talk about is, you know, the evil COVID regime and everything like that, but you're not offering like here is, um, you know, the, the this is where we can be going. And here are some concrete examples. That is what is is uh, sometimes lacking and, and sometimes much, much harder because it's it's easier to focus on an on an enemy. Um, but much harder to sketch out that positive vision because then you actually have to answer um, the critics of of what you're sketching out there. Um, but yeah. I think that's probably a, a good place to leave it. Um, and I thank I want to thank Camille for uh, joining us today. Th thanks for the talk again, Nick. And uh, we'll see. Th thanks for everyone who left comments. Uh, sorry we didn't get to all of them, but we'll including uh, sketch therapy who believes that CRT is a combination of sexual Marxism and racial Marxism, yeah. but not class-based Marxism. Why not? Why not? Why not economic Marxism? Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. We'll see you next week.